Hello, and welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. Jesus has risen, truly he has risen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Happy Easter. I am recording this on Easter for Divine Mercy Sunday, which is the second Sunday of Easter, right? And um, what we're going to talk about this week is two things. I already did that podcast on the mercy of Jesus um, and his conversation with a sinful soul, a despairing soul, a suffering soul, and a soul um, that's seeking perfection, right? So I didn't want to repeat that for Divine Mercy. Um, so I'm going to talk instead about how sometimes God's mercy is severe or difficult for us. And in particular, I want to share with you the story of my littlest brother, Johnny. My, I'm 100% Polish and my family, um, my parents had 12 children and then we took in foster babies between the time they were born and adopted. And Johnny um, got caught up in the court system and after two and a half years, we were able to adopt him. And about 15 years ago, he was killed in a car accident. And um, it was a great act of God's mercy, right? Here's St. Faustina next to the icon of Jesus resurrected. And so um, I'm going to share that story with you. And then I wanted to share with you um, some ideas about the um, hope right? Hope, I guess, is just like kind of um, reasons to hope, right? And I think hope is very connected with divine mercy because divine mercy gives us hope, right? We can hope in that mercy of God. And about, well, it was 2008, um, you know, I went on retreat and um, I felt like the Lord gave me a retreat on hope, and it was funny, I wanted to share it with you, and I went back to my computer and Googled it, and um, it said it didn't exist in my writing, and I knew that it did. And then I went through the books, page by page, I couldn't find it. Then I started praying to St. Anthony, and voila, it was right where I thought it was in November of 2008, because um, Obama had just been elected, and people who were faithful Catholics were very down, because... Um, he was so pro-abortion and so against so many things that the church um, teaches and holds dear and important, right? And, um, you know, a lot of people find themselves in that same place now because we have leaders that are very pro-abortion. It's even worse because they say they're Catholic. And there's a lot of evil being propagated in the world, right? And then you have the co you have coronavirus, and then you've got the vaccines people are spreading, but then those their connection with the aborted babies, and then you start kind of going into that, and you realize all the experiments that are being done on, on babies. Um, it sounds like the times of Hitler. And all you have to do is you know Google um, the bioethicists of the church, and you can get that information. Um, and it's, it's on the one hand, you want to know the truth of what's going on so that we can fight it. On the other hand, you um, can feel overwhelmed with so much evil. I mean, this is going on in the free world, right? And you have the persecutions of the Christians and the communist countries and the Muslim countries. Um, and so much confusion of gender identity and um, just a lot of people's personal sufferings. So this is a time of year that the Lord especially wants us to focus on hope, right? He died. He suffered and he died. I don't think you can see the crucifix next to this flower. But he suffered and he died to heal us and to give us hope. And um, that's his great mercy. So I have 10 um, reasons to hope in this Easter season, sources of our hope. And um, hopefully it will make your heart a little lighter and your step a little quicker um, when you realize that we weren't made for this world. And that's kind of where Johnny comes in too, right? So at the beginning, I'm going to just sing Alleluia, sing to Jesus because um, it's Easter. And um, 
I'll be honest, I haven't been able really to get that gumption to sing um, ever since Christmas, probably. But it's like moms and I'm sure priests feel the same way sometimes where you have to give even if you don't feel like you have anything to give. <laughs> so we're going to try, right? I pulled this out and I wrote the chords in this book about 20 years ago, but I thought I could play it. So we'll try. Let's start in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be recreated and thou shalt renew the face of the earth.
So sorry, that's not perfect. <laughs> when I started to try to sing at Mass last night, I realized I haven't sung in so long, I guess, except to my little nanny girl. <laughs> I make up songs all the time to her, but my voice is not, um, is not in, in practice these days. But we shall repair that, right? We just have to pray to the Holy Spirit. And I think Easter season's a beautiful season to wake up the voice and to sing, right? So, mercy and hope, hope and mercy. That's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to start here. We have this image of St. Faustina, right? We'll stick her in front here for a second. And Johnny. I was able to take Johnny to her, um, to her convent in Poland. And um, when he went up to the relic and he kissed the relic and then, you know, we were there praying and he was such a teenager. He was so annoyed. And the deal was, I said he could come back to Poland with me for the summer, but I was giving retreats and I was doing things like that. And I was like, you have to live my vocation with me, right? I, I'm not, you know, going to sightsee or to have parties, but I did take him to Auschwitz and I took him to St. Faustina's Shrine. I took him to, um, to Czesnachowa. I took him to some places like that. And, um, after we left St. Faustina's church, she, he kept saying, couldn't you smell the roses that filled the whole church? What was that incense that was in there? And I said, there was no incense. And the people we were with, we asked, and they said, no, there was no smell in there. And I said, you know, it wasn't during a service. It was just adoration. And um, he said, oh, the smell. So I know St. Faustina loves Johnny. And um, Johnny's interesting. He was one of those people that when he was with really good people, he was really good. And if he was with bad people, he always wanted to fit in. So he was not very strong and choosing the right thing all the time, right? And, uh, you know, he never got the memo, um, you know, to hide things. So, like, if he were to do the smallest thing wrong, he was always caught. <laughs> he was always caught. And... Um, he, he wasn't, you know, very prudent in that way, which, or cunning, which is, you know, a good thing on the one hand. But, you know, sometimes people say, well, Johnny was such a handful. Not any more than the rest of the crew. Um, he was caught. And um, he suffered a lot of persecution because of his race. And um, he was, you know, kind of falsely accused of quite a bit. I was a witness to it and I was too young. People wouldn't listen to my voice. Um, but he also did things he shouldn't, you know, um, but he would be so sorry. And he would come to me and say, Mary, will you take me to confession? You know, will you take me to adoration? And um, it was interesting because I took him to Poland that summer and we went on this retreat and he was annoyed. But I think now it was like the devil kind of um, rousing him up, right? And we had adoration one night. And um, I'll put the pictures at the end of this podcast because I, I, can't, I don't have them printed to hold up, but I have them on my computer. And we, we went to adoration and he got up and he said, you know, I'm leaving. I'm so angry. I'm just leaving. I don't know why, but I'm really angry. And I said, okay, well, you know, go outside and take a walk and see what happens. And I just started praying and you know, really crying out to God to do something for my poor little brother. And uh, all of a sudden he appears at the door of, um, we were in like a, like a high school or something giving a retreat, but we had like a temporary chapel set up. And so he was in the door of whatever this big hall was for, that we were using as, a, as the place for adoration that night. And he had tears streaming down his eyes. And I got up and went over and he like collapsed in my arms. And I said, come in, come in, come in, you know. And um, people had the opportunity to go up towards the altar and to kneel there. And he said, I'm going up there. And I said, okay. So I went behind him and he went up and he knelt down at the altar. And he threw his arms on the altar and you've got the monstrance with the blessed sacrament and you've got Johnny sprawled out on the altar and he is sobbing. And the Polish youth were really beautiful because they happened to have bongos there. 
And so as Johnny starts sobbing, they go from Polish praise and worship music to like African drums. And the place is pounding in African drums. And Johnny's weeping. And one of the, there are two priests on the retreat. And one came up to me and said, ask him why he's crying. So I said, Johnny, why are you crying? And he said, it's so beautiful. I get the chills. There is such a war for my soul. And I said, that's why you're crying? And he said, yes. He said, I feel this war between Satan and Jesus. And all I want is to be with Jesus. And I feel like I do things I don't want to. And I'm turning into the exact person I don't want to. And I'm afraid that Jesus is not going to win. There's a war for my soul. And I'm afraid that Jesus is not going to win. And um, we allowed him to lay there and to cry. And then the priest came over with the holy oils and gave him the anointing of the sick. And it calmed him down. And then he went back and he just kind of collapsed on my lap on the ground. I was sitting kind of Indian style. And, and we prayed. But those words stuck with me. There's a war for my soul. And I'm so afraid that Jesus is not going to win. So... The summer ends and he really wanted to see the ruin in Spain, in Tabernas, Tabernas, the southern part of Spain where I lived as a hermit all by myself. So I said, okay, it's not that hard to take a bus from um, Poland, you know, through France down to Spain. And then I knew Spanish enough and I knew Madrid enough how to switch out at the bus station and find one for El Maria. And then we we're in El Maria to find one to go up to Tabernas. So I thought, okay, I think I can do this by myself with him. So I took Johnny and uh, I took him to the ruin where I was. And um, he loved it. And he said, he actually said, I want you to die, Mary. And then I'm gonna do pilgrimages to all the places where you've been and served. <laughs> and it's kind of funny because he ended up dying and uh so you know we did that and then i we he went home and uh that was in august and i was supposed to stay in poland that year um and i spent lots of time in poland during you know those years of my life and i would pray and i would help on retreats and i was there were really good families and religious sisters that would take me in for months at a time um, and allow me to just um, to live my kind of hermit vocation in a room in their home. And um, in October, I heard in prayer, you have to go home. And you will return to Poland on April 25th. And I had never before in the years that I had served... Um, been told by the Lord to go home and then been given a date. I thought that was, you know, so I went home and I knew that Johnny was at home and he was struggling and he had decided to enter the army that spring. And I thought, okay, the Lord wants me to go home and prepare G Johnny for the army, right? For the world. I helped him get his license or we, we almost, he had dyslexia. So he's having a hard time with the test, but I had arranged with them to, um, give it to him orally and um, I took him driving and I got him a job and um, I would take him on retreat and we would go to adoration and um, we just spent a lot of time and when I was home around him he, he was in a good spot and my family asked why did you come home and I said I don't know Jesus just told me in prayer go home until April 25th so um, towards that time I was preparing to go back to um, Poland. And on April 20th, um, or the 19th, I always mix up the date because he died at midnight, but it was the day that they announced Pope Benedict as the next Pope. And he asked me if I could take him to work to say goodbye to his coworkers and things. And he said he'd catch a ride home. So I took him. And on the way, I asked him what he thought. And he said, well, I really like Pope Benedict. And, I, you know, but I was hoping it would be Cardinal Lorenze because I wanted a black pope. And, um, you know, when he got out of the car, I said what I always do. You know, I love you, Johnny. God be with you. And he left. Well, by 10 o'clock, he was supposed to be home. And he wasn't home. And he wasn't home. And 
I started worrying and praying and I couldn't sleep. And I watched the ambulance go by the front of the house, which was strange because we don't really have a lot of traffic back there. And I prayed for whoever it was. And um, in the middle of the night, the police came and, um, and told us that Johnny had died. And I remember thinking, is it done? Are you sure he's dead? And he had had an accident down the street from us. And um, the, the people that it was in front of their house were afraid to call the police for a while. So he laid there with a brain injury, awake, suffering for an hour before the paramedics came. But the paramedics told me that his eyes were open and he had this incredible peace for the amount of suffering he would be in. They said the peace oozing from him was tangible. And uh, by the time they pulled into the hospital, he had died. And what had gotten me, I remember just saying, Jesus, mercy, Jesus, mercy, Jesus, mercy. It's all I could say. And hearing my dad um, call each of my siblings and hear them crying, screaming through the phone. I'm going to cry. It was so, that was almost harder than Johnny dying, was to see the pain, to see my brothers almost have to crawl in the house from sorrow. And... Um, and a lot of people had regret. I knew I had given Johnny everything. And sometimes he accepted it and sometimes he didn't. But I had tried. And I realized at that moment that the Lord had sent me home to prepare Johnny for heaven. But I still had one big pain in my heart. Um, and that was he didn't receive the sacraments. Which I found out later that a different neighbor eventually saw the ambulance and all that and went out and he had been a Protestant pastor and he prayed with Johnny. So I thought, okay, he didn't have the sacraments, but he had a minister of the Christian church praying with him, right? And the paramedics were real Christian and they prayed with him. And, um, but it, it bothered me. I said, Lord, why, like the Pieto, you know, why did you allow me to be awake in my bed suffering we're like not even a half a mile down the road is my little brother bloody and laying there dying alone. Why didn't you let me know that to get there? And I would have held him as he died. I would have prayed. I would have gotten a priest. And it, that was the one thing that didn't, didn't resonate in my heart. And um, at the funeral, I'll never forget after communion, the Lord spoke to me very clearly in my heart. It wasn't like words that you hear in your ear. Um, but I know that it was an inspiration that came from him. And um, he said, Mary, you know, I sent you home to prepare Johnny for heaven. And that last moment of his death wasn't yours to have with him. That was mine. And I thought, you're right. <laughs> He said, you would have gotten in the way. And he said, you know, I am the eternal high priest. And I was with your brother when he died. Because I was like, there was no priest. There was no priest. And I whispered his sins into his ear. And I absolved him. And I anointed him. And I was with him. And you would have gotten in the way. And I kept thinking when the paramedics told me the peace that was coming from him. I thought, I know that. And many miracles have happened to people, especially those kids back in Poland, whenever they prayed to Johnny. So I feel like I have enough um, confirmation that he ended up in a really good place. And uh, I still had like Gregorian masses said for him twice. <laughs> Lack of faith. I've had lot, we've had lots of masses said for Johnny. But um, if, you know, he went right to heaven, then the Lord, you know, used those them for somebody else. Or maybe he knew we were going to have them, and so he used them at that moment because God is outside of time. But why am I telling this story for Divine Mercy Weekend? Because Johnny's death was the mercy of God. Johnny's death was Jesus answering his prayer sprawled out on the altar in adoration in Poland, where he said, there is a war for my soul, and I am so afraid that Jesus is not going to win. In Johnny's death, Jesus won. 
I believe that Johnny was so weak if he had gone into the army. There's so many temptations. He would have easily fallen into them. And I don't think he would have been able to keep himself away from, from grief sin. And so here I was at home. We had just recently gone to confession together. We were going to adoration. He was praying. And so he was in a good spot in his heart to meet the Lord. And I believe his death was a severe mercy of God. So we asked St. Faustina to be with him. You know, we can even pray now that she be with him then because God is outside of time. And we ask him to intercede for us as we continue to discuss mercy and hope, right? Johnny's story, you know, his funeral was, I mean, it was out the, you know, church, it, not just standing room only, it was packed. At the funeral home, I think that was like a five hour wait to get in the funeral home. Um, the people who, um, Ran Billings said that um, they had never had a funeral with that many people ever. And after mass, you know, they had asked me to talk just for a few minutes. Just, I think Father said, keep it to three minutes. And I was like, oh, great. Just a few words on Johnny. And um, when we finished, I'll never forget one of my brother's friends coming up to me and saying, this is the happiest funeral I've ever been at. <laughs> he said, um, you know, a tragic death, uh, you know, of a 20 year old man should just leave everyone in angst. And there is such joy and peace here. I know that there's something of God in all of this. Well, that was the virtue of hope. That was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that had orchestrated Johnny to pray what he did in Poland. And the Holy Spirit that orchestrated his death, as tragic as it seems humanly, right? Because the Holy Spirit has chosen the moment for each one of us to die. And, um, you know, on Johnny's tombstone, so my parents bought me a tomb, a, a plot, a burial plot next to Johnny, which is funny because I always wanted to get buried at Notre Dame, but it's probably better, St. Vincent's, because it ended up being my parish as an adult. But um, his, his tombstone is Jesus of divine mercy. It's this image St. Faustina is holding. And Jesus promised that that chaplet, whenever it's prayed for somebody dying, would do miracles. And... Um, you know, the Holy Spirit orchestrated all of that. He orchestrated that I am going to be next to my brother physically on earth for an awfully long time once I die. <laughs> and um, he's already orchestrated my death. He's orchestrated my parents' death that's, that's, you know, next to us there. And I think about all the people I know in that cemetery as I wander through from our parish and um, old family friends and one of our neighbors and... Um, you know, my sister-in-law's mom is right near us. And then I have a few nephews um, that were miscarried or stillborn that are buried right there at that cemetery. And it's so beautiful because death doesn't have the last answer, even in a cemetery. Um, cemeteries are beautiful places for me to be because you pray for those souls, but then those souls go to heaven and they pray for you. And it's sad because on earth, for the few years we have left here, we can't see those people anymore. But if we live life the way we're supposed to, we're going to have eternity with them. And so there's great hope. There's great hope. Hope is ultimately from the Holy Spirit. So I want to go through these 10... Um, these 10 reasons of hope, right? Um, reasons for our hope. The first is the Eucharist. Why should we hope right now? No matter what happens in the world, you know, say we were in the middle of a concentration camp during World War II, why would we hope? Because of the Eucharist, because the Eucharist exists. The Eucharist is our source of hope. The Lord is our shepherd. There is nothing we shall want. 
In verdant pastures, you let me graze. Beside restful, safe waters, you lead me. You restore my strength. You guide me along the right path for the sake of your name. Even when I walk through a dark valley, I fear no harm, for you are at my side. Your rod and your staff give me courage. You set a table before me as my enemies watch. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Only goodness and love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. Jesus is our good shepherd in the Eucharist, and he's in the world. He exists. New life is coming from his heart at all times. Heavenly streams of light and love and hope pour forth from his Eucharistic heart to the whole world, even though very few people know it or recognize it or honor it, right? When everything is really difficult, we're supposed to go to the Eucharist and climb inside of his Eucharistic heart. And he will wash us in his purity. He will give us drink of peaceful, trust-filled rest. When he went up to heaven in the ascension many years ago after the resurrection, he left his heart with us in the Eucharist to be a source of hope to be a door into heaven so that every time we go before the Eucharist, every time we receive him into ourselves, heaven is opened up inside of us. What a great gift of the mercy of God to leave himself with us in something as humble as bread so we wouldn't be afraid, right? If we saw the might and the glory of Jesus in the Eucharist, a lot of people would be intimidated by his holiness or afraid. So he left himself in bread, right? So our first source of hope is the Eucharist. When everything seems really dark around you or hopeless, look toward a tabernacle lamp. Look toward that little red light in church. Know that Jesus Christ, both the man who died bloody on a cross from you, the man who rose from the dead, and God, who is almighty, all powerful, all love, is present in the Eucharist for you. For you. What greater gift of mercy? Could he leave us to become that vulnerable? It's one thing to humble yourself and to become vulnerable, even if you're in the hands of somebody who actually loves you and wouldn't hurt you. It is something way more incredible to become vulnerable and little in the hands of somebody who you basically know is going to hurt you, who, you know, is sinful and it, that's what he does before us. He knows that what men are capable of, and he still entrusts himself to us. But it's because he doesn't look at us and just see our sin. He sees hope. He sees redemption. He sees the power of his resurrected love within us, right? He doesn't look at Johnny and just see where he fell, you know, and did things he shouldn't sometimes. He looked at Johnny and saw the man he was supposed to be in heaven, that he was created to be, that he would be once he was redeemed. And so he snatched him because he wanted him to fulfill that purpose of the Father. Jesus looks at us in the Eucharist with great hope. And he says, like, here is my heart full of love, and I have hope that you will receive it and that you will be transformed by it and that you will be a bearer of Christ's light to the world. So that first gift of divine mercy that we get this weekend is the Eucharist. It's the source of our hope. If Jesus is with us, Nothing can else can happen, right? I mean, Paul says, if Christ is with us, who can be against us, right? Think about, like, 
if you're, say it's easiest to compare it to a marriage. Say you're married and something really bad's going on, but if your husband's right there, then you feel a certain strength or protection or, or comfort, right? Jesus is that for us times a hundred jillion. Think about a child crying in the night and if their parent comes in, how it just makes everything all better. You know, it's still dark. You still hear the thunderstorm. You still have the bad dream in your mind, but you have the presence of love. Multiply that times a million. That's Jesus in the Eucharist. And he's here as our source of hope. So we need to be sure that especially when dark presses in or, or temptations to despair or be overwhelmed with the world, that we go and we soak in his Eucharistic love and ask him to fill us, make us people of hope. The second kind of reflection is um, hope that comes from littleness, being little, right? The gift of being little. O oh Lord, my heart is not proud, nor are my eyes haughty. I do not busy myself with great matters, with things too sublime for me. Rather, I have stilled my soul, hushed it like a weaned child. Like a weaned child on its mother's lap, so is my soul within me. Israel, hope in the Lord, now and forever. Right? Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. You might be little. You might just be like a tiny babe in the arms of God, but hope in him, right? Be at rest. If you're little, you're able to trust God and then he's able to act. So it's sort of like your littleness is your defense, right? It's like curling up like a weak little child in the lap of God and letting him defend you. Right? The Lord himself will fight for you. You have only to keep still. The littler you are, the more God can do for you. Think about Our Lady in the Magnificat. The Almighty One has done great things for me in my lowliness, right? He's lifted up the lowly. Just like a baby in the arms of their mother lays there like nursing or at her breast. We are to lay in the arms of God and nurse from his heart to drink in his presence. That is our strength, that is our clarity, that is our meaning. And we do that in the Eucharist. It's tied to that first one, right? The source of hope. But we have to be very humble and little to accept that gift from him, right? And on the cross, Jesus wasn't trying to fight it all like this big warrior. Instead, he embraced littleness as his hope. And he just said like a baby, Abba, 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 Father, 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 right? Father, forgive them. Father, take this cup. Father, why have you abandoned me? Father, Father, Father. And as a child in littleness, the Father Reach down. It's like the beautiful cross that they, they have. I, I have painted one icon of it, um, of the Father holding Jesus on the cross, right? He does everything for him. Jesus just obeys. So our sources of hope are the Eucharist and then littleness. It's very tied to that. Jesus becomes little in the Eucharist to give us hope, right? To give us life. We become little when we receive him because we realize that we're receiving almighty God into ourselves. Who are we to question the plan of God? Who are we? God is God and I am not, right? So it's, um, it's being little and embracing that littleness that we can have hope that, you know, once you're little, then God is going to enter in. And what greater hope do we have than the presence of God with us? Spousal love. That's the third source of hope, right? It's a gift of mercy. What does Song of Songs say? Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. More delightful is your love than wine. Your name spoken is a spreading perfume. 
That is why the maidens love you. Draw me. We will follow you eagerly. Bring me, O king, to your chambers. As an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my lover among men. I delight to rest in his shadow. His fruit is sweet to my mouth. He brings me into the banquet hall and his emblem over me is love. Strengthen me with raisin cakes. Refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left hand is under my head and his right arm embraces me, right? I belong to my lover and for me he yearns. So where do we get hope from the Eucharist? From being little and entering into that great gift of mercy. We can only be, accept the mercy of God when we're little and by being like his wife, right? And St. Paul in the Ephesians talks about um, a husband washing his wife with the word, making her without blemish. Because Jesus not only loves us like a child, but loves us as his wife, as his bride, the church. He is a passionate love that wants to clean us and wash us with what are his kisses? Every word he speaks, his tears, his blood, his embrace pouring over us. That passionate love is a gift of mercy. Why would a perfect man love an imperfect wife? But he does. And he makes her perfect. He makes the church holy and without blemish. And we're all part of that, right? The cross can be ugly. You know, you look at the cross and people say, I don't want to look at a bloody crucifix. It can be ugly. But if you look at the passionate spousal love Jesus has for his wife, his bride, the church on the cross, there's something very beautiful about it, right? In the midst of our own crosses, Jesus's pain is our hope. Let me say that again. In the midst of our crosses, Jesus's pain is our hope. Why? Because in the cross, we can meet Christ's pain. Christ didn't have to have pain. Jesus was perfect. So any pain he suffered on the cross was for us, was his compassion for us, his enduring it to give us strength, to give us healing, to give us freedom, to give us heaven. So when you're in the midst of your suffering, if you can look at the bloody wounds of Jesus crucified, his pain is your hope. Because these wounds were endured to heal you, to free you, to make you holy and strong and good and beautiful and without blemish. And then he resurrected them, right? To the degree you suffer the crucifixion with Jesus is the degree that you will rejoice with him in the resurrection. So in the midst of your pain, your cross, his pain is your hope. Think about when you're enduring something difficult. If somebody comes up and says, I don't want to hear about it. That's just mean, right? Or, you know, your husband could blow you off or, you know, your mom might, you know, totally not understand your high school problem, <laughs> right? But if you have somebody that says, tell me about that, I want to hear it. And they have tears well up in their eye and they suffer because you suffer. That's real authentic love to suffer because another person is suffering. So we see that in Christ, his pain gives us hope because it's a proof of his love. He doesn't want us to suffer, right? Jesus's humility in coming to us is broken in half on the cross, but he's willing to endure that because, again, it's atrocious because he loves you that much. It's proof of his mercy, right? So our source of hope is the Eucharist, and it's a gift of his mercy. 
Another source of, of hope is our littleness, right? That's a gift of his mercy. He does everything for us. He makes us humble like he is. Another source of hope is his marital love for the church, his powerful, passionate love that wants to wash us, to suffer with us, and to make us unblemished, to make us perfect. That's a gift of his mercy. What does Song of Songs say? Set me as a seal on your heart, as a seal on your arm. For stern as death is love, relentless as the netherworld is devotion. Its flames are a blazing fire. Deep waters cannot quench love, nor floods sweep it away. Were one to offer all he owns to purchase love, he would be roundly mocked. Set me as a seal. By Jesus' gift of marital spousal love for us, we're like tattooed on his heart, and he's tattooed on our heart. We're set as a seal on each other's hearts. That's a gift of mercy. That's a source of hope. The next are the flowers under the cross. Mary, John, and the church. So what does it say in the Gospel of John? Now in the place where Jesus had been crucified, there was a garden. So often in the midst of suffering, we don't see those beautiful gifts that God is trying to give us. In the midst of the passion, people didn't see the garden that the cross was standing in, right? But John said that now that when the place where Jesus was crucified was a garden, there was beauty there. It just seemed that his pain overtook that. Well, on that cross, in that garden, Jesus gave us Mary as our mother. He gave us John as our older brother, and the church was born from his side. So no matter what is happening in the world, we have a reason to hope because we have a mom named Mary. We have, you know, the church, both triumphant in heaven and suffering and purgatory and here on earth with us, around us. Maybe the particular people you know at your parish or the priest isn't very helpful to you all the time. But the church is way bigger than that. Go pick up a saint book. Turn on a podcast. God will bring you brothers and sisters. You're not alone. That's a gift of his mercy. In the place where you're crucified on earth, there's a garden. It's the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. It's his love of you in littleness and spousally. And he gives you support in Mary, in John, right? In priests and bishops and in saints, in the whole church. Those are sources of hope, right? And on the cross, Jesus found hope in Mary and in John being faithful. You know, the rest of them all ran away. But when he looked down, he saw them and had hope that his suffering wouldn't be for naught, that there were people responding to his love. If they were a source of hope for Jesus, they should be a source of hope for us, right? And they are his gift to us, a gift of mercy and a gift of hope. Mary and John stood faithful as witnesses of light and of life, of truth and of love, conquering all death and sin. They were radiant under the cross, even in their tears, even in the blood. That's a source of hope. And we're drawn into that so that they can give us that hope and then that we can become that in the world, right? No matter what hovel you find yourself in, whether it be a rich, you know, suite in New York City or under the bridge with the homeless people, both are hovels. You can be that source of hope. By looking to Mary and John as your example, looking to the whole church and then bringing them with you, you are never alone. That's a gift of God's mercy and it's a gift of his hope. He gave us two mothers, 
Our Lady and the Church when he was on the cross. That's, our mer that's, that's mercy and that's our gift of hope. The next is the Holy Spirit, who is the source and the river of hope. You know, it reminds me of um, that story in Ezekiel of the, of the temple being filled up with water and first it's to his ankles and then to his knee and then to his shoulders and over his head, right? That's our lives. First, the Holy Spirit comes and he might tickle our toes. And then if we receive him, he fills up to where we are drowning in the Holy Spirit. But it's not bad. We're dripping with him. He's our breath. He is our life. He's our defense. He's our comfort. He's our strength. He's our discernment. The Holy Spirit is a river of hope. That is a great gift of the mercy of God for us. In John, Jesus said, if you loved me, you would keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you always, the spirit of truth which the world cannot accept, because it neither sees nor knows it. But you know it because it remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live and you will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and observes them is the one who loves me. And whoever loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and reveal myself to him. Whoever loves me will keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our dwelling in him. The advocate, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. And in Psalm 1 it says, They are like a tree planted near streams of water that yield its fruit in season. Its leaves never wither. Whatever they do prospers. The Holy Spirit flows in and around and through our lives. He is the greatest gift of the mercy of God. The very love between the Father and the Son. That we receive in fullness in baptism. That's renewed powerfully every time we go to confession and remove sin. Every Eucharistic sacrifice that we attend at Mass, every time we receive Jesus into us, we receive the Holy Spirit. In confirmation, he pours out upon us through those hands of the bishop. In your marriage, he explodes through the sacrament of marriage to help you love your husband or wife holily, right? With holiness. He comes through the anointing of the sick to heal and to strengthen you to prepare you for heaven if you're at the end of your road. And in ordination, he changes a man with an indelible mark. It's incredible. The Holy Spirit is a stream of joy and peace and hope and love and mercy. He's a river that's poured out into us. And so no matter what you, suffering you encounter in life, the Holy Spirit can be your source of hope because he is a gift of mercy. The next thing that can give us great hope are the promises of Jesus. He promises us hope. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God. Have faith also in me. Right? Amen, amen, I say to you, you will weep and mourn as the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will become joy. We grieved when Johnny died, but it's become joy. When a woman is in labor, she's in anguish because her hour has arrived. But when she has given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the pain because of her joy that a child has been born into the world. So you also are now in anguish, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. 
On that day, you will not question me about anything. Amen, amen, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have not asked anything in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. I have told you this so that you might have peace in me. In the world, you will have trouble. But take courage, I have conquered the world. Jesus is the word and the words that he speaks to us, he speaks to us, gives us life. Where there is life, there is rest, there is joy, there is peace, there is hope. Jesus wants to plant his life-giving words, his promises in our hearts to be sources of hope, right? It's the great mercy of God to say things like this. Don't be troubled and afraid. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give you. Those are great promises, right? You will weep and grieve, but it will be turned to joy. We need to find our hope in those promises that Jesus gives us. They're little drops of his mercy to help us along our way, to heal us, to strengthen us, to renew us, to guide us. Jesus' word is a promise to us. He leaves so many beautiful words, especially in those Last Supper discourses of the Gospel of John. If you're ever struggling, just go back and reread those over and over. And it's not just his promise in his words, but it's his presence in that word, right? Sometimes it's not just the words somebody speaks to you that themselves that, um, that help you, but it's the presence of the person speaking it in love, right? His word is a source of hope. The next source of our hope is union with Jesus and the Trinity, right? And it kind of comes from his promise. He says, whoever loves me will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. That's a source of hope, union with Jesus and the Trinity. Not just his promise, but his reality of it. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit and every one that does, he prunes so that it bears more fruit. You are already pruned because of the word that I spoke to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. That itself is a source of hope. Jesus is saying we can remain in him. That's mercy. We don't deserve it. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit because without me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me will be thrown out like a branch and wither. People will gather them and throw them into a fire and they'll be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, if you live what Jesus has asked, ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father loves me, so I love you. Remain in my love. That's a source of merciful hope. As the Father loves me, so I love you. That's a lot of love. That's divine love. He's not just sharing part of it. He's saying all of it can be yours. Why would we not hope if the person in charge of the universe speaks words like that? If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. He doesn't want to give us partial joy. He wants us to have complete joy. This is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends, not to run away from them, not to reject them, not to betray them, not to deny them, but to lay down your life for them. 
You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you slaves because a slave does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I've told you everything that I heard from my father. It was not you who chose me, but I who chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will remain so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. This commandment I give you, love one another, love authentic charity. So what a great source of mercy we receive today and a source of hope, union with Jesus and the Trinity by the possibility of remaining in his love. Not even just like, say you're really hot and you find a pool and you can come and you can splash some water on your face or take a little drink with your hand. No, he says, jump in and remain there. Be not hot and parched any longer. Be safe in my love. That's a gift of hope. Another gift of his hope is his love. The love of Jesus should inspire us. They're all connected. They're all different aspects of love, right? But the fact that Jesus loves us unto death, right? But the fact that he loves us is a great gift of mercy and should just give us hope no matter what happens. Well, at least Jesus loves me, right? That's what we should say. The scriptures I chose for that was, Master, the one you love is ill about Lazarus. And it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Jesus wept and the Jews said, See how he loved him? Jesus' love is the basis of our whole existence, right? And if the love of Jesus and the Trinity was able to create us and sustain us, don't you think that it can take care of us no matter what we encounter? That's our hope. Even in the darkest night, Jesus' love for us is our only weapon against Satan's lies against Satan's attacks through people in this world. Jesus's love is some strong enough to, to be our light in the midst of, imagine being on, at the, on the sea with a raging storm, violent. I can't imagine being on a boat in the ocean in a terrible whirlwind. Like that would be petrifying. Like you're just gonna fall into this like abyss of darkness. Jesus is the lantern that doesn't flicker in the wind. He's the rock, the stability that you're anchored to and you won't flip over. He's that quiet, gentle, loving voice saying, shh, 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 right? To calm you. Jesus said this illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God. His love is that great. He wants to glorify God in everything in us. That's probably the song I should have sang. Christ be magnified, right? Christ be magnified. In every moment of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Like the Magnificat, right? Everything in us, our life, our death, our suffering, our darkness, our, our joys, our successes, it all should glorify the Father. And that happens if Jesus' love is received by us as a gift of his mercy and it is held by us as a gift of hope. Trust. Trust is a great source of hope. <laughs> it's making room for the king's mercy. Jesus is our king and he's offering us hope. We can only receive that merciful hope if we trust him. What does he say? Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God, have faith in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. Johnny's in one of them, right? If there were not, I would not have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself so that where I am, you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body and what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Notice the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, yet God feeds them. How much more important are you than a bird? Can any of you by worrying add a moment to your lifespan? If even the smallest things are beyond your control, why are you anxious about the rest? Notice how the flowers grow. They do not toil or spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of them. If God so clothes the grass in the field that grows today and is thrown in the oven tomorrow, will he not much more provide for you, O you of little faith? As for you, do not seek what you are to eat, what you are to drink. Do not worry anymore, right? In Luke's version, he says, do not worry my little flock, right? My little sheep. All the nations in the world seek for these things and your father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom and these other things will be given to you besides. Do not be afraid any longer, little flock, for your father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your belongings, give alms, provide money bags for yourselves that do not wear out, an inexhaustible treasure in heaven that no thief can reach nor moth destroy. For where your treasure is, there also your heart will be. Come, you are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Trust is an act of the heart. It's a willful act motivated by love to place all control of one's life in the hands of another. We're called to do that to Jesus. But that trust, that act of trust can be a source of hope. And it is definitely an opening to the portal of his mercy. Jesus knows we're even too weak to trust on our own. So he gives us the grace to trust. Sometimes just saying, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. That's his grace speaking that in us. And it gives us hope. It is a source of hope. The Father's gift of mercy is an endless ocean of love for all of us. He desires to place that ocean of his loving mercy within each one of our hearts to consume us, to carry us back home into heaven. Every time you trust, you make room for the Father's mercy, for the Father to place the Holy Spirit blooming forth hope. It's so beautiful. And the last one is connected to trust. It's fiat. Fiat is a source of peace and light and hope no matter what you encounter, right? It's like the night Johnny died and I just said, Jesus, mercy, Jesus, mercy. That was fiat, fiat. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Not mine. I have to trust that your plan for my brother's salvation is greater than what I see or your desire is greater than what I have and that you're taking him in death at the moment he would be most wonderfully glorified in heaven. You're doing what's best for him. Jesus spoke again and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am and I do nothing on my own. I say only what the Father taught me. How I desire that. How we all should desire that. To say nothing but what the Father has asked. To do nothing on our own. That's real fiat. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what's pleasing to him. I always say fiat. That's a gift of God's mercy in our life. If we're able to live such a fiat and that kind of a fiat will give hope, right? 
I can't tell you how many times I encounter, you know, things that seem almost insurmountable. And I say, well, fiat. And like you kind of laugh and you go forward and then you have hope. Because when you, it's like saying, Jesus, I surrender everything to you. Take care of everything. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat, but if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there also my servant will be. The Father will honor whoever serves me. Jesus says, you have to say fiat even unto the cross, even unto death, like a seed dying to the ground. And then that fiat will give room for God to enter in with his mercy. And he will bear forth hope, joy, peace, the Holy Spirit, resurrected love to the world, right? In order to keep God's life blooming in us constantly, we have to live fiat. That's what this one is saying right? You have to keep a union with him. And we keep union with him by saying fiat, right? Every time we say fiat, we have union with him. Not my wound, my, not my um, will, but yours be done. Other sources of hope for us, angels, there's angels everywhere. When you feel alone or overwhelmed, like The angels from the courts of heaven are in this room. They're with you wherever you're listening. That's a great source of hope, right? And the saints who struggled to accept this great mercy of God that we celebrate today in Divine Mercy Sunday, they've gone before us and they've succeeded in following these different 10 sources of hope. They've accepted that mercy of God. And so they were sources themselves of hope in other people's lives. So that's it for today. Jesus, we praise you. We adore you. We glorify you. We thank you for your mercy and for your hope. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Blessed second week of Easter.